2020. Business Insights is an exciting webinar series hosted weekly on Mondays at midday by a panel of industry thought leaders for business owners who simply want to be in the know about the latest and most significant news and initiatives in the Australian business landscape that impact how they do business. Our panel of advisors aim to inform, educate and provide strategic insights to the changes in the economic, legislative and financial landscape that affects small business. We aim to guide our viewers to navigate business challenges through COVID-19 and beyond. Let's now meet our panel of industry thought leaders. First, I've got Bernard Tuamau from MGA Insurance Brokers. Morning, Adam. Morning, panellists. Then we've got Lisa Garrido from Enigma HR. Hello, everybody. Mr. Robert Skeen from Oasis Skeen Property Buyers Agents. Good day, Ed. Good day, viewers. Thanks for having me. And the uh, hairier version of Mr. Sam Garashi from Moneyclip Private Wealth. Hello, everybody. Great to be on board. And uh, Ian McLaughlin from Imperium Accounting and Tax. Thanks, Adam, and welcome, viewers. And of course, I'm Adam Lyle from bizdoctor.com.au, and here we go for another fantastic Monday. Well, as you know, the market is rife with rumour and innuendo about what the hell's going on coming out of the other side of the budget, and the opposition is certainly making lots of noises. And who better to start off with what's happening in the know financially other than Ian McLaughlin. I'm gonna start with you today. Can you let us know what the latest is with JobKeeper 2.0 and beyond? Thanks, Adam. What I thought to, I'd do today was, because I did touch on it last week, just one of the uh, measures announced in the budget, and there's a fair bit to cover here, so I thought I would just dedicate uh, one week to it. So I wanted to talk about the loss carryback provisions. Okay, so the government has confirmed that they will introduce this loss carryback scheme that will allow businesses to claim back taxes paid on previous year's profits. So basically it means that a business that was previously profitable but is making a loss due to the COVID-19 pandemic can claw back some of the taxes they paid. So it serves to acknowledge the particularly tricky business environment brought about by COVID-19 and to support businesses that would likely have been profitable otherwise. So businesses with a turnover up to $5 billion, $5 billion will be eligible to offset losses in order to generate a tax refund. So the scheme will apply to losses incurred up to June 2022 against profits made during or after the 2018-19 financial year. So eligible businesses will receive a tax refund when they lodge their 2021 and or 2022 tax returns. The scheme is estimated to benefit around 1 million Australian businesses employing some 8.8 .8 million workers. And the treasurer, Josh Frydenberg, estimates that this is going to create around about 50,000 jobs. So what I thought I would do is, is just work through an example of how this works because it can be quite complicated. So let's just have a look at this. We'll have a talk about this example. So let's say in the year ended 30 June 2019, the company has a taxable income of $5 million and they pay income tax. They've paid the income tax already at 27.5% on that of 1.375. Then, in the year ended 30 June 2020, the company was impacted by COVID-19 and they made a loss for tax purposes of $2 million. Then, in the year ended 30 June 2021, the company was still impacted by COVID and they made a loss of 500,000 in that year. So we've got a total loss in those two years of two and a half million. So the way it works is, is when the company lodges its 30 June 2021 tax return, it can carry back its 30 June 2020 tax loss of $2 million and its 30 June 2021 tax loss of 500,000 against the tax liability it paid in the, in the year ended 30 June 2019. So how would that look in numbers? So for the year ended 30 June 2020, because that is a 27.5% uh, company tax rate year, 2 million times 27.5% equals 550,000. And then in the year ended 30 June 2021, 
because that's a 26% corporate tax rate year, uh, the loss of 500,000 multiplied by that corporate tax rate of 26% gives us $130,000. So when we add the 550,000 and the 130,000, we get to 680,000. So that would then be able to be offset against, um, it would be claimed as a tax offset in the company's tax return. Um, now, just a couple of important things to note here. Um, the tax offset is limited to the balance of the company's franking account. So let's say in that year, for example, that the company uh, had only had a franking account balance of 600,000 then they could not apply the whole 680,000. They could only apply 600,000. And that measure has been uh, introduced to limit the possibility that the refunds are gonna give rise to franking deficit tax. So just a couple of other um, uh, eligibility criteria that we need to look at here. So obviously the, the, the company needs to be carrying on a business. We mentioned that the, the turnover of the company, aggregated turnover, so that's in its associated entities need to be less than 5 billion and the company's income tax returns for the year of claim and each of the prior five years need to be lodged. And only tax losses are eligible, so not capital losses. And tax losses generated as a result of expensing capital items under that now uh, unlimited uh, asset write-off, they're available as well. So it's really, really uh, an interesting uh, measure this. I'm, I'm liking this one. So I think there's going to be a, a number of businesses that uh, are going to take advantage of this. So, but once again, you need to apply for it. It's not going to happen automatically. So you need to make sure that, you know, if you need some extra assistance with this, get in touch and we'll be able to help. Well, Ian, for an accountant, um, I usually would say you've lost me at the word tax, but you absolutely nailed that and you explained it in very simple terms. Uh, it's clear as day your knowledge is profoundly uh, you know, superior uh, to most other accountants I know. So I do encourage everyone to have a chat with Ian if you're unclear as to um, what he was talking about beyond the word tax. Um, moving on to Sam, uh, the markets have certainly had some uh, interesting developments over the, the last week since the budget, haven't they? Yes, yes they have, um, uh, Adam. Um, so we've had a couple of good weeks of uh, market increases. The week before was uh, was huge uh, on the back of the budget. And last week, the ASX rose again by 1.6% on the back of the banks uh, being re-rated at the moment. And also the technology uh, companies continue to march so upwards. The US is a bit more of a seesaw uh, right now. Um, obviously, there's so many different types of information coming out of the US. Um, they don't know if they're after or after or uh, but uh, following the uh, budget discussions we had last week, I thought I would actually talk about the self-employed as well um, in relation to um, um, investments in super in particular. Um, obviously, better tax rates is going going forward is going to help with better cash flow, and we covered that off last week. Uh, there's benefits to the apprentice um, allowance, and obviously that's going to help in uh, profitability of self-employed people in terms of them being able to put extra people um, on. Uh, the instant write-off and the carry-back provisions that, uh, that's been covered off before, they're both very good uh, items um, that uh, self-employed can, uh, can carry. And obviously, I encourage you to speak with, uh, with great um, tax accountants like, like Ian uh, to, to see how you can take advantage of those particular items. Now, whilst there was no specific changes to super, um, but as a self-employed, you can, you can still put in $25,000 of pre-tax dollars in your um, in your account, in your super account. And if your balance is less than 500K in your super, you may be able to do some catch ups for on the last year or two as well. So um, if uh, cash flow allows, you can put more money from a pre tax perspective uh, uh, in there. You can still put in additional funds in from your after tax money, 100K in one year or up to 300K in rolling three. Uh, and that's obviously useful in this uh, lower market period to build up your account. Now, I have been asked a lot about should I put a lump sum of money in super or a regular amount as a self-employed because as often the tax planning comes in June and that's when their money normally goes in. And personally, from an investment perspective, obviously markets go up and down throughout the year. So my feeling is that regular payments over the year um, is a much better way for you to deal with it from a cash flow perspective 
and also a better discipline uh, behind building this as you as you go. Um, you may have heard that the self-employed may be eligible for the SME loan that are 50% government guarantee. Um, the amount that you can qualify for has also increased. And obviously you need to see your bank and see if you can qualify for that. Um, but ultimately, anyone who's self-employed should still think about only building their business, not only about building their business, but also building other buckets of investments passively. So their reliance on your one source of income being your self-employed income becomes less over time. And obviously that puts less pressure on your uh, business for, uh, for retirement. And that's the, uh, the market update. And uh, I'll have to talk about interest rate um, um, now or in a, in a little bit. Yeah, let, let, let us hear all about it today because you know, before Rob Skeen takes all the glory. <laughs> sure, of course. And so uh, Reserve Bank recently announced um, um, that they were going to hold the current rates as it is and at best dropping the cash rates to 0.1%. Um, so we might see some activity in that when they meet in, uh, in November. Um, however, there are much, a lot more chatter about what they're going to do in terms of their activity in the bond market. And bond market affects the fixed rates. So fixed rates could also potentially be lower in the coming months and obviously we'll wait and see how that actually transpires. Um, now, in terms of uh, self-employed for the uh, for the interest rates or, or the lending side of the things, there are a few things that you need to be mindful of and understand about how a loan is done for self-employed. Uh, one is uh, banks are a lot more shy at the moment when it comes to self-employed because of the uncertainty of income um, right now or in general. Often they have to rely on outdated documents to assess the suitability. For example. We're in October 2020 now. Um, they will look to your June 2019 financials plus some of your recent BAS to make a decision about lending you money. So obviously that outdated period is a risk to the bank. Now, of course, due to the COVID, they want to compare BAS statements, some to some up to four, um, to see how you have been traveling in the pandemic period versus the pre-pandemic period. And if there are discrepancies, that might affect your problem. Some banks will use one year's financials, and some banks will use two year's financials to look at your, uh, your numbers. And some lenders are starting to restrict the lending to self-employed to 80% loan to value ratio, meaning that you will need 20% deposit and you need to be able to cover your cost of stamp duty and so on. Now, generally speaking, capacity of borrowing is based on the profit that the business makes, and then adding back uh, some items that's going to allow, allow the bank to make a good decision about your true profit position. And these things are depreciation, limited to legitimate one off uh, expenses, and any wages that you pay yourself. So the bank's going to pay those back into your profit to get a, a bigger number that they will then rely on. And uh, obviously you need to be mindful that many banks take into account the debt within the business. So if you've got a car lease, equipment lease, other types of borrowings, the banks will take that as commitment and that will impact on your borrowing capability. Ultimately, the bank just really wants to know that there, there's certainty of uh, you borrowing the money and then uh, being able to pay it back when it's due to be paid back on time. And, uh, and, on, and with that, I'm going to pass you back. Thanks, Sam. Um, again, you know, uh, knowledge is king and uh, you've certainly got lots of it. Um, speaking of knowledge, I'm really keen to hear about this DY property that sold for like, I don't know, six times what the, uh, what the value was put on it. Uh, are, are agents out there actually undervaluing uh, properties at the moment, Rob, just to get uh, people in the door for an auction? Look, uh, they've been doing that for, for many years, you know. I think uh, back in the good old days when a property uh, was going to auction, these, the agents would be taught by their owners, quote it low watch it go, quote it high, watch it die. So the whole premise of the auction is to get as many people there as possible. So they'll quote it an attractive figure, get as much people interested and hopefully on auction day, those buyers compete and, and it sells well over reserve. All right, and what else is happening in the uh, world of property, Rob? Okay, so yeah, le that probably leads into uh, the numbers today from last Saturday, uh, the 17th of October. The property market had 639 homes going to the gavel with a final clearance rate of 75%. Strong, really strong. Um, if we look at this time last year, it was 80%. And it makes me think, panellists, 
what recession are they talking about when it comes to property? The property market continues to be resilient in a recession and in a pandemic. I mean, the figures are, what is it, close to 1 million people out of work. We see cafes and restaurants fairly busy you know, with people dining out. Retail figures are up. Are, are you guys seeing this? I mean, you know, where's the recession happening? Is it outside the metro areas? What are your thoughts on that? The interesting thing, Rob, is that there's a lot of argument, particularly over commentators over the weekend, that there's actually a two-speed economy starting to um, uh, come about. Uh, those who've got money are prepared to spend it. Those who don't uh, are going to be uh, coming out the other side of it much worse off. I, I was really keen to hear your insight about how resilient the property market is because even outside of Sydney, uh, when Susan was standing in for you a couple of weeks ago, she was indicating that things are going gangbusters elsewhere as well. Um, it could well be that the government are you know, banking on the buoyancy of... of uh, of the share market and in fact the property market to keep uh, confidence um, at least in check. Yeah, good point, Ads, and, and I guess all these incentives that they've put through are, are working as well. Um, my real estate tip of the week, and, and it's a good one, it's the fundamentals I, I say of real estate, and that is everything is negotiable, and I mean everything. I um, was taught this by one of my first mentors and leaders, uh, a gentleman called John Luce, and his company was called John Luce Real Estate. He's passed away now, may, may poor John rest in peace, but that's one thing, uh, principle that he taught me, that everything's negotiable. And, and how he would do that, every Thursday would have this caravan, whereby all the agents would go around and look at each other's new listings, and everyone at the end of the caravan, over lunch, would give their opinion on price and things like that. And so John would take us to all these different restaurants every Thursday. And this particular Thursday, he took us out to Hungry Jack's. And I thought, oh, gee, this is going to be interesting because he'd asked for a discount at all these restaurants we visited. So anyway, he ordered the meal, um, asked the salesperson, you know, can you give us a discount on the meal? Obviously, the person on the counter didn't have the authority, the authority to do so. He went and got the manager. And the manager came out and John said, look, I've just bought, you know, 20 of my staff lunch, can you give us a discount? And the manager looked around and he said, look, sure, give you 15% off. So a very important lesson that John taught me. And, um, you know, I ended up trying to ingrain that as a habit. So my first time out negotiating with John's principles, I went to Cook Eye. It's a female clothing brand with my girlfriend at the time over 20 years ago. Anyway, I bought, uh, we bought seven items of clothing. I took it up to the counter and I said, look, can we get a discount? And she looked at me, you know, quite strangely and said, sir, you know, like with a plum in her mouth, we don't give discounts at this store. Obviously, my girlfriend at the time was very embarrassed. I could see she was starting to blush. Anyway, I held my nerve and I said to her, listen, we've got seven items of clothing here. Surely you can do something. And once again, she turned around and said, I just said to you, sir, we don't discount. And I said, surely you can do something. And she said, look, okay, I can't give you the discount, but... We'll give you two free singlets. Anyway, last week, I'll come fast forward to today. Last week, we had somebody come out from Winston Blinds. We're getting some new blinds in the office. And uh, she gave, he gave Natalie, my business partner, the quote. And it was a, with a 15% reduction. Uh, anyway, they sent it through via, via email. Nat sent it to me and I had a look at it. And I said, Nat, go back and just ask the question if they could do better. She did that. They came back and said, no, Dan, the salesperson gave you a 15% discount. That's the absolute rock bottom. I said to her, can I get Dan's mobile number, please? So she sent me over the number. I waited 24 hours. I called Dan the next morning. I said, Dan, thank you very much for the quote. We, we like it. We really want to go ahead, but you need to sharpen the pencil a little bit further. And he said, Rob, I've, you know, I've given you the best that I can. And I said to him, Dan, if you give me a little bit, I will send the money into your account in the next half an hour. Anyway, he chucked a hundred bucks off. So I got it even cheaper. Nat was impressed, my business partner. But the point being is that, and I didn't really need to save the money, but the important, the important thing is, is that, and the point being is that you have to get in the habit of negotiating. And you know, what a great skill to have, especially when it comes to negotiating the larger items in your life, whether it's machinery for your company, a car, or perhaps even a new house. Get into the habit of it, people. 
<laughs> I know in Sam's culture, they've been doing it for years. Now, just imagine too, can I say, not only are you going to save money in terms of these larger items, but if you negotiate all these little items, imagine over a year how much money you can save. That's my tip for the week. Thanks very much, guys. Well done, Rob. Now, speaking of negotiations, I've heard about some amazing deals being made with people at the moment. Um, because getting good people to manage uh, businesses and to man stores and to, you know, in the hospitality industry in particular, there's a shortage of skilled workers. Uh, um, surely, Lisa, you've been involved in some tense negotiations for some good people. Uh, are you seeing much activity going on? Oh, absolutely. Um, just uh, to comment on our discussion here about the two-speed economy, we have not been busier and at this uh, juncture recruiting at the moment as an internal HR team. So there are definitely pockets of the industry that are growing. Um, there's a lot of headhunting going on. And that is a, a result of the fact that in the Aust Australian labor market, good talent is always been um, limited. So the candidate shortage is across the board, no matter how many people say when they advertise, they get gazillions of ad responses. If you look at the quality of the responses, it is, has always been the same. Good talent is really difficult to find. So what I wanted to cover um, now, Adam, actually, is a little bit about a summary on the job maker. And then the good news is where the market is picking up in terms of in terms of the job front. So this all ties up. So last week I, um, I went through um, the job maker subsidy or the credit for each new job that employers create and they hire someone between 16 and 35 years old. Um, and again, to recap, the credit is $200 per week for 16 to 29 year olds and $100 a week for 30 to 35 year olds. And it'll be available for a period of 12 months. So um, apart from the major banks, all other businesses are eligible with this scheme. And again, just a reminder to qualify, new employees are required to render 20 hours of work per week and must have received the job seeker payment, a youth allowance or parenting payment for at least one month out of the three months prior to being hired. So um, clearly what's happening is post the announcement, um, the Morrison critics have hit back, pointing to the budget's lack of support for the unemployed who, have, who come from the older demographic, i.e. voila, us, right? So there have been um, um, a lot of feedback on this. And his response really, Scott Morrison's response really, is that is exactly what the job maker is supposed to, is designed to do. It's designed to consider youth, um, the youth and creating um, employment for the youth because the youth unemployment rate is more than double what the national unemployment rate is, which by the way is forecasted to reach about 8% in December, in the December quarter. So the goal of job maker is to generate 450,000 new jobs, but not to edge out those already in the workforce or so the prime minister says. If that really works, it's, it's about getting or giving additional jobs um, and getting more people into jobs. Now, obviously what the critics are concerned, including Albanese in opposition, is that um, the anyone over 35 will be competing against those who are big, being given some wage support. So it does give us some disadvantage. However, clearly what the government currently is saying is there are record investments in infrastructure, which are designed to boost a job creation. Now, don't forget there's also um, the trainee and apprentice subsidy, which extends support to 100,000 new positions. So it's only capped to 100,000 new positions where 50% of the wage subsidy will be covered by the government in this, um, in this budget. So the good news is in relation to this, if um, organizations are looking to upskill and retrain and if individuals like us are looking to upskill and retrain, SEEK have now come up with a report of 20 roles that employers are keen to hire for. So unsurprisingly, nursing roles are on the top of the list. This hasn't changed since February and the report in February, but there's a higher demand for those working with the elderly and the disabled. 
and the lockdown has fueled increase in e-commerce activity. So there's a rising demand for jobs in warehousing, storage and distribution. So let me tell you what the top 20 jobs are. Nursing, all roles, warehousing, storage and distribution, aged and disability support, automotive trades, admin assistants, sales reps and consultants, physiotherapists, occupational therapists and rehab, child care and outside school hours care, chefs and cooks, retail assistants. So you're right there, Bob, there's a big demand and there's a big push for retail to get back in the full swing of it. Developers and programmers, mining as in engineering and maintenance, laborers, um, how hard is it to find good plumbers and tradies these days? Road transport, psychology, counseling, and social work, dental, child welfare, youth and family services, plant and machinery operators, business and systems analysts, and in, with a mining industry, anyone in operations. So while this demand uh, will give some good news to an estimated 1 million Australians who are unemployed, the demand for workers is not universal due to the different levels of recovery in different states and territories. So for those businesses in these sectors that I've just outlined, you are going to be faced with a high demand for your current employees. Your current employees will be headhunted. And the likelihood is that if they're not happy with you, they will be looking at other options because these options will be available to them. So you will need a robust recruitment strategy coupled by an outstanding retention strategy for the good talent. So that's that for me. Well done, Lisa, and of course, um, that is really pointed advice, particularly in this um, market where everyone's jumping ship uh, that I've seen and heard so many stories about that only in this last week. Now, someone- well, 50% of current employees are actively looking in the market now. Yeah, yeah. So that's very interesting statistic. Now, someone who isn't jumping ship, he's not going anywhere, he's stuck it out, he's, uh, he's been very patient, he's Mr. Bernard Tuamau. Now, Bernard, what's going on in the insurance world? Thanks, Ads. This week's headline, Weather Bureau predicts more cyclones as La Nina arrives. Sounds like a bit of a date night for Rob Skeen on a Saturday night. Anyhow, the Bureau of Meteorology expects an average of 11 tropical cyclones for the upcoming season, which particularly starts around November and runs through to April. So Australia usually has nine to 11 cyclones during this period. We've usually about three or four of those cyclones crossing the Eastern coast. What this means is more heavy rain, more storms, and potentially more cyclones coming up between November through to April. So it's a very important time for business owners, property owners, landlords, and customers alike to ensure that they are adequately insured. So this is separate to the usual bushfires that we generally see between the December and February period. These are strong cyclones and strong storm, storm surges that will have some sort of impact on you and your business. So it's an important time for you to make sure that your sums insured are checked, you're adequately insured, and make sure you are covered for storm surges, cyclones, you know, bushfires, all these, you know, all these typical events that we see during this period. It's a very busy time for loss assessors, claims adjusters, and insurance brokers. Speaking about um, insurance brokers, insurance advisors, a report prepared by Deloitte for the National Insurance Brokers Association highlighted the very important role that insurance brokers played, in particular during this pandemic. Of the report, here are some of the four key findings. Number one, brokers encourage greater competition in insurance with the average neighbor broker offering a variance of around 10 products. What this means is not only are we giving you some personal advice, we're out there making sure that you're getting the best deal. I think that's what a lot of customers do forget. Number two, brokers reduce under insurance by roughly around 45%. So what basically what this means is that when you're working with an insurance broker, you're less likely to be underinsured. So instead of being insured, undervaluing your stock or your contents or even your building insurance, you're more, you've got a better chance of having an insurance broker that makes sure they give you the right guidance around the levels of insurance that you should have. Number three, 
Brokers save each client an average of 11 hours, which equates to about $230 million in time savings a year. So instead of you mum and dads who are working from home, trying to save some money on your home and contents insurance, or business owners who just don't have the time or the energy to do their own shopping on, for their insurance, the value of the insurance broker is, is that we come to you with alternate options, giving you the best value for money advice. And lastly, brokers enhance distribution and clients reach with over 38% of broker premiums written for clients outside the capital cities. So let's not forget the rural areas and everyone that sits outside the suburban areas, insurance brokers allow us to enhance the channel and your reach. So what's my point, ladies and gentlemen, if you don't have an insurance broker, get one. That's all for me, Ads. Well done, Bernard. And, uh, and yes, go, go to the Wallabies uh, when we're on home soil. Uh, moving forward. Uh, not a word from you, Skeen. Um, oh, I do want to say something. I love it, Bern. That was really great advice. But to clarify, a date night with me is more like tumbleweeds blowing through the OK Corral. OK, folks, um, <clears throat> now we're going to get back to some reality. Uh, I just got, I've got a story to tell uh, this week, um, and it was about something that uh, a, a client that came my way from a bookkeeper that uh, uh, had, a, had a customer that um, uh, was really stressed on Tuesday morning, like mega stressed. And the bookkeeper said, what's going on? Oh, I've got this letter from the landlord, they're gonna kick us out. And that's not the worst of it. The bank's just written a letter saying, okay, you've had your six month uh, time off, uh, we want our money. And by the way, we gave you a hand up, we gave you a standover for six months, but we actually want not only the monthly payment, but we need you to um, make additional payments to cover the arrears for the last six months. Really stressful situation. And the reality was that it didn't need to ever be that bad. What they tried to do was um, do what they thought was negotiate a standover with the bank. And they relied on the legislation for the landlord uh, to make sure uh, things uh, weren't great. My point is every single one of the people on this webinar today can help in that scenario. The accountant, the insurance broker, the property person can find new premises or help negotiate with landlords. A HR person can make sure the people are okay. Sam can make sure that the finances are all in check. And I can certainly make sure that from an overall perspective, the business can survive when obstacles like that come up. So I know mine's a short one today, but hopefully it brings together what we're trying to achieve with this seminar. Uh, and we do it every week and we're committed to it. We may change it in the future to once a fortnight or something like that. But being connected with fantastic advisors like we've got here today is the whole point of the exercise. Now, one thing I did um, miss out on saying earlier is that the views and expressions that are aired today by the, by the panelists are not designed for your personal needs. They are not to be taken as personal advice and are not designed to be advice for your specific circumstances. If you need that, you need to reach out to each of the panelists today. We do have to leave it there. We've run a little bit over time today. So really appreciate you uh, joining us today. We'll be sharing this via Facebook and uh, YouTube later during the day. We look forward to seeing you next Monday at 12 o'clock. Uh, for the person who's having a terrible um, bad hair day and certainly a bad camera day, it's uh, Adam Lyle here who's going to sign off. Uh, thank you, Ian, Bernard, Rob, Lisa and Sam for joining us today. Thank you.